This podcast is brought to you by the School of Advanced Study, University of London. Thank you very much, Nedra. Thank you for coming out early on Friday morning or late on Thursday night. Well, I don't know what the time it is. I'm not remembering. So. Um, this paper is called Imitation Play and Observation, and I've added a little word in the middle, and now called it Situation and Shakespeare's comedies, though in fact, as it turned out, I don't actually get to Shakespeare's comedies until very briefly at the end, so I hope you'll bear with me, and I do lots of other places before then. And it concerns itself with some really quite basic facts about what we do when we look at drama and what actors are doing for us in acting, and I'm now not sure, rereading it, whether the facts are not so basic as to be quite banal, but I'll let you decide about that. You can throw things at me later, or even during the paper. I can dodge. Um, I'm especially interested in what. Uh, sorry, I'm not especially interested in what uh, is designed to baffle or challenge or subvert our understanding in this paper. Um, types of relation that I think have sometimes become overvalued and, and even perhaps commodified. Uh, though I believe that relations of unfamiliarization are sometimes necessary and often quite interesting, it seems to me that the opposite moment of communication, of exchange and understanding between stage and audience is also important, and, and that's what this paper especially wants to attend to. So I start with some pieces of theatre that I didn't understand. <laughs> In January this year, I was very fortunate to attend part of a theatre festival hosted by the National School of Drama in Delhi. Okay. Can you hear me? Yeah, okay, I'll just look at it. In Delhi, in India. And this annual event, which is now in its 15th year, brings together modern and traditional dramatic works from all over India and from international companies. And two works that I saw during my few days there struck me as useful entry points to thinking about the question of the translatability of dramatic material between languages and cultures, of what survives and what resists that kind of dislocation. The first play was written by Professor Nataraj Hulivar and directed by Nataraj Honavali and was played in the Kannada language uh, by a small troupe of actors from Theatre Taktal in Bangalore, in Karnataka, in South India. And its title was Shakespeare Manegabanda, which means Shakespeare comes home. And you can find a short trailer for it on YouTube if you want to look it up afterwards. And it was lively and engaging and featured songs and strong choreographed stage movement presented by an energetic company of young actors. The plot, according to a brief synopsis in English provided with the program, concerned Shakespeare's return home to Stratford-on-Avon and his long-abandoned wife, only to discover that the Stratford, the Stratford townspeople were now completely obsessed with his plays and had adapted various of them to their own purposes in unexpected ways, so that each townsman had adopted as his own emblem a specific one of Shakespeare's characters. Bottom, Shylock, Othello, Corrie Lames, and so on. Through whose experience, through, whose, through, through the, the experience of which character, he now expressed his own purposes. And so the play, as far as I could tell, consisted of conversations about the way in which individual townspeople had selected characters, and then they would play out small sections from the plays, and then readapt them and talk about them in complex ways that I couldn't follow. One sequence, for example, featured the so-called brothel scene from Othello, played once, according to the original, as far as I could tell, in Canada language, and then again in a different version that the townspeople had worked out. And the play was clearly a complex and even quite poetic work, responding vigorously to the various impact of Shakespeare on the social and educational structures of post-colonial in India. And that, one, that much one could fairly see. But that brief resume is about all this non-Canada speaker was able to follow in the action. Many complex details encoded in the dialogue were completely unavailable to me, although audience members around me were clearly very engaged in subtleties of argument and exchange between Shakespeare and Hathaway and various Stratfordians. 
And if my ability to read clues and discern situations derived from Shakespearean fictions hadn't been fairly well developed, I expect I would have been even more in the dark. Notwithstanding the skill of the presentation, which was very high, I was in a position not much better off than the basic appreciation of Edna Everidge's colour and motion. So that I, though I can wholeheartedly commend Shakespeare Manega Banda to you as an interesting evening in the theatre, I can't tell you much more about it than I just have. The other piece that drew my interest for today's purpose was a new play from Manipur, uh, which is a province, I had to get a map, um, in the far east of India along the border with Myanmar and Burma. Uh, and it was written by Mai Paksana Harangbam and directed by O. Prafula Chandra and performed in the Manipuri language by a Manipuri company working in the Shuman Lila tradition. And if, as I was, you are unfamiliar with the Shuman Lila tradition, some background is probably helpful. Shuman Lila are usually called folk plays, but in fact they serve a much more immediate and live function in Manipuri society than we associate with such vestigial folk drama, so called in European traditions as Robin Hood or mumming plays in English. They're not played directly from traditional texts, they're rather contemporary, new composed plays written to address local issues and founded on the reinterpretation of historical and legendary narratives about the ancient families and environment of Manipur. They're usually performed by a company of some eight or ten in outdoor or semi-outdoor courtyard spaces where a large square playing place with a single ramp entry at one corner is completely surrounded on four sides by audience. And the action is accompanied by a suite of traditional musicians who provide a continuous and very effective soundtrack for narrative and expressive purposes that the actors themselves don't actually sing. And in fact, the performances are, among other things, a kind of religious ritual in themselves that always begin with a, a ceremony sanctifying and dedicating the space for the duration of the performance. Um, traditionally, they were often performed in temple courtyards, though now they're, they're often also performed in community centres and so on, as well as outdoors. Shivang Lila plays are widely performed by troops in Manipur, um, and they're quite popular, and they appear in regular festival competitions in the state. In this February's festival just this year, for instance, there were 13 companies performing new plays, and one of them, entitled E. Marie, uh, which means blood relations. I got the Facebook Manipur Dictionary um, editor to translate that. Um, was the play that was presented in Delhi, performed by the group Sana Leibach Nachon Artists. As with Shakespeare Manega Banda, the program supplied a basic synopsis of the plot of E. Marie, which concerned some episodes in a legendary long-running feud between two aristocratic families, a bit like the Mahabharata, though not in fact at all related to that part. The key episode of this play concerned the madness of an elder son of one of the families, induced by some sort of intoxicant thrown into his eyes in a duel with his very thrasonical adversary from the other family. And this intoxicant caused a kind of wild rage in the course of which he managed to accidentally embed a magic knife in his forehead um, and went about the stage uh, at length with a knife embedded in his forehead, which subsequently turned him into a sangai, a brow antler deer, the sacred animal, animal of Manipur. And his transformation into the deer was really quite wonderful as he took on the, the physical characteristics of the movement profile of the deer and then went away and came back in this marvelous orange deer costume with a set of brow antlers prancing up and down uh, and being the deer roaming in the forest. Escaping into the Manipuri jungle, he was pursued at length by his family and others until at last he was accidentally slain by his own brother. Uh, and this tragedy caused a reconciliation between the feuding families, only a temporary one because the constant outbreaks of animosity between these families form the substrate of these, this legendary cycle. 
And I've since learned more about the resonance of this particular play in relation to contemporary conservation efforts around the same idea in Manipur. And these reports have made clear how powerfully the image of the man transformed into this deer resonates, since the Sangha idea is held to embody a sacred link between human and non-human words, worlds. An outline account of the play puts it this way. The message is loud and clear. Peaceful coexistence among different communities of human beings is not enough to bring about universal peace and harmony. It is only when we stop killing and destruction of all living beings including the invaluable flora and fauna, and realise the fact that the whole world is one family, that real peace and harmony will reveil, I think it means prevail, uh, the trouble-torn planet today. That's from a Manipuri online newspaper. A news item from early February this year reported in the Huayan News in Manipur also discussed the recent, the recent poaching death of a same idea. There are very few of these animals left alive. Um, in direct reference to the play E. Marie in the report of the poaching. Two persons from Thanga area were arrested for reportedly killing and butchering the Sangai a few days back. Had they witnessed the Shumang Lila E. Marie, they would not have killed the precious animal, rather they would have worshipped the endangered creature as their forefather. I've spoken at some length about this play, in part because its tradition is not widely known and because based on what I saw, I believe that Schumann Lila is, in fact, one of the world's great performance traditions. But for present purposes, what struck me about the performance I attended was how easy it was to follow. The more striking because I knew neither the main story nor its various episodic off-branchings. And this was in distinct contrast to the Carnatic play, which I've seen the night before, where, although the background matrix of Shakespearean fictions was thoroughly familiar to me, the details of the action were frequently quite obscure. Aside from the great skill and authority of the Schumann Lila performers, what was it that allowed an audience of largely non manipuri speakers to sustain so high a level of delighted involvement in the narrative and the emotional turns of the play, even without any knowledge of the deeper resonance of the legends being explored? To say it was the simplicity of the story merely relocates the question, what character did the story have that made it simple and accessible? The key lies, seems to me to lie in the relative transparency of the scenes, easily decodable without specific linguistic elaboration. The structural positions of the participants, matters above all of gender, age, affiliation and status, were available from readily recognizable clues posture, gesture, facial expression, and movement, assisted in some respects by costuming. Usually tell a king from a servant by what he was wearing. In general, what I found I could extrapolate fairly easily, even without the brief clues given in the program, could be conveniently described as the situation in a given scene. So I found myself getting very interested in, in the notion of situation as a driver of audience experience. The ability of an audience, in this case, to grasp and assess situation seems to me a key competence in the making of theatrical meaning. In most of E. Marie, but not through much of Shakespeare Manega Banda, the key narrative relations among the persons were fairly clear. That is, their overall relation with respect to one another and its implications in terms of possibilities for action could be ascertained, more or less. Relevant here seem to me Dario Fo's brief remarks on how situation generates and manages a tension between stage and audience. This is Fo. I won't do the accent. <laughs> In theatrical terms, what is situation? It is the basic structure which allows the progress of the narrative to be constructed in such a way as to involve the audience in the tension and to make it participate fully in the unfolding of the plot. It is the mechanism that grabs the attention of the audience and keeps them on the edge of their seats. Alessandro Blasetti used a more colourful expression when he said, it is the nail sticking out of the stool which keeps the spectator's bottoms in the right place. <laughs> This is, as so often with Faux, very shrewd about what binds audiences and performers together. Faux sees situation, 
the extraction, comprehension, and anticipation of events, their relations, and their tendencies as a defining task for all involved in a theatrical relation, one that manages attention and controls tension, anticipation, and release. The comparative fuzziness of Foe's term seems to be compensated for by its flexibility, its way of returning recurrently to the connection between stage and onlookers. I find it a useful approach to thinking about what audiences spend much of their time doing in the theatre. But how could we try to refine an account of scanning and understanding a dramatic action in terms of situation? One well, could perhaps begin by putting it in relation to Aristotle's remark about what audiences do when they evaluate acts of representation and respond to plot. In Poetics 4, Aristotle claims that, quoting him, the reason why we enjoy seeing likenesses is that as we look, we learn and reason out what each is. For instance, this is so-and-so. Aristotle's emphasis on reasoning out in Greek sylogipsisthai, uh, constructing syllogisms, actually, literally. Here deployed as more or less formal syllogistic reasoning with respect to identifying the object of mimesis. He later develops further with respect to the more extended business of following a dramatic narrative, describing our typical procedure of observing and evaluate the re evaluating the relations of incidents according to probability and necessity, This analysis, like Foe's, throws emphasis squarely for readers and spectators on active involvement in piecing together and following the action by observing, inferring, reflecting, and projecting, by engaging in an ongoing evaluative process in relation to the, to the flow of incident and person across the playing place whether a page or stage, Aristotle doesn't seem to care much whether we're reading or watching. Centrally, one asks, who is this? What sort of person is he? What is she doing? What choices does he have? Where is this situation likely to lead? A great virtue of Aristotle's account is its attention to how complex these questions can be and how invested audiences become in them as we synthesize what, for him, is the central term of his discussion, the action. Situation, from this point of view, is a name for the local and relatively circumscribed segment of an action. An action, reciprocally, is no more than a succession of situations, linked together by some graspable mechanism of causation or association, whose canons may differ quite radically sometimes, by culture and style. If the Manapuri Shuman Lila play was easier to decipher than the Canada play about Shakespeare's homecoming, part of the reason may lie in the relative ease with which its situations could be observed, understood, and just as importantly, projected forward into subsequent actions. Well, what are the basic tools we bring to comprehending a situation? Where do they come from? And how do we deploy them in drama? Two years ago, in the height of the Australian summer, God help me, I was visiting Monato, an open range zoo in rural South Australia. It was a very hot day, just under 40 degrees. And the zoo was about to be closed because when it tops 40 degrees, uh, if a bushfire comes through, they can't evacuate the pedestrian cars quickly enough and so you won't get burned up. They're busy saving the animals, they don't care about the people. There were not many visitors at the zoo that day, which meant that we happy few could wander and linger more or less as we chose. The zoo's chimpanzee group were very wisely spending most of their time in their two-storey air-conditioned indoor enclosure, unlike the spectators who sweated it out on the punishment side of the thick glass that surrounded them on two sides. Since the viewing platform was raised and shaded and open to the breeze and conveniently supplied with water, I spent over an hour watching the animals and talking to their attendant. And there were only about five of us there, so we, we got uh, a good chance to talk to their attendant about what they were doing and to observe them doing it. There had, she said, the attendant said, some months earlier been a changeover in the alpha male of the troop with an older chimp 
ceding his position to a younger one and adopting a kind of emeritus or mentor role. But the new Alpha was not as adept a politician as his predecessor and was not managing intergroup tension very effectively. And as a result, there was now considerable stress inside the group. So everyone was moving about, looking for position, uncertain when some other animal was going to push forward or try something on or generally create trouble. And this may not be entirely unfamiliar to university academics. <laughs> what struck me with a special force in my brief observation of the group was the sustained intensity of continuous mutual, usually covert though not always, observation, especially pronounced in the relatively concentrated indoor area, though the attendants said that they're doing this all the time when they're outside anyway, it's just that they're further apart, so it's not so immediately obvious. The chimps, as we in turn observed them, and they occasionally at us, were constantly watching each other's actions, assessing intentions and implications, tracking who was sitting with whom, who was moving where, who had a banana, um, and so on. And the atmosphere was electric with a kind of incipient action that I could only sense as, as dramatic, not only because something large or loud seemed always about to happen and not infrequently did happen, but also because of the quality of expectation and concentration that chips were lavishing on each other the live, raw momenthood of observation and the nervedness of attention in the enclosure. And several times there were, in fact, outbreaks of violent motion and shrieking, which the attendant was able to interpret, though I often missed the triggering clues or incident. She knew well enough to know what was going on. It was very interesting that she could say, ah, oh, that chip's just done this, and this one's going over there, and now that one's going to protest. Um, None of this world of observation and social inference within chimp groups is news. Of course, primatologists have been observing it for a long time, and evolutionary biologists have suggested its, import its importance, proposing that increased complexity of social life has been a major driver in primate evolution. In particular, they noted how a rapid expansion of brain size and complexity correlates with increasing diversity and complexity in primate social networks. And this work has identified two broad currents within primate sociality that keeps groups functioning and whose dynamics grow increasingly complicated in proportion to growth in group size and complexity. Cooperation, on the one hand, and the management of dishonesty, on the other hand, including both the practice, the detection, and the deterrence of dishonesty. Higher primates, it appears, invents, invest a huge amount of time, energy, and brain power monitoring social relations to keep cooperative strategies functioning, anticipating and allowing for competition, and constraining it from becoming too destructive of the welfare. In order to manage this social complexity, primates, including humans, if you've ever spent our time watching humans watching each other, you'll be aware that they do this too, spend a very great deal of time and resources simply keeping track both of one another and of relations of position, status, action, and implication among one another. Monitoring, projecting, inferring, responding to social clues and information are almost constant activities. Large amounts of energy go into registering, analyzing, and responding to situation, as I'm considering it. And to do this with sophistication, including to both engage in and anticipate deception in the presentation of status and planning, humans have learned in particular to form impressions and make hypotheses about the situation and intentions, the usual shorthand is the state of mind of those they observe, and to frame their responses accordingly. And this projection can, go, can grow quite complex, so that hypotheses about the perceptions and evaluations of others can be even nested within one another to generate intriguingly complex situational assessments of the kind recorded in such sentences as, she thinks her father believes her brother mistaken to suspect her of lying to him. Which is a very complex, but readily comprehensible situation, I'll read it again. She thinks her father believes her brother mistaken to suspect her of lying to him. And that actually sort of pushes the limits of English grammar. There are other languages which could designate that final pronoun, him, more specifically. Um, you know, all of, most of like Henry James is found in all the same sentences. <laughs> and that's one of the reasons why it's so fun to read. Because you read the same sentence four or five times and finally you begin to understand the complicated network of mutual attributions of situation 
and assessment that's at stake. My students hate that. <laughs> Brian Boyd, in his work on the evolutionary foundations of art, points to the centrality uh, to the development of narrative of this advanced interest in contemplating complexity of situation. Storytelling, this is Boyd. Storytelling appeals to our social intelligence, fair enough. It arises out of our intense interest in monitoring one another and out of our evolved capacity to understand one another through theory of mind, our capacity to comprehend events, many facets of which we share with other animals, underlies our capacity for story, but should not be confused with narrative, with telling events, an effortful process we undertake only to direct the attention of others to events real or imagined. And Boyd proposes that art is grounded in a skilled manipulation of attention that exploits fundamental mental preoccupations above all the detection and enjoyment of pattern and the collection and manipulation of social information. On his account, narrative art invites its witnesses to inquire into, make hypotheses about, extrapolate and form judgments on the intentions and strategies of human agents in complex virtual situations. And recursivity in narrative is something we especially enjoy as it offers higher order complication of basic mental operations with social information as tests of our sophistication. In narrative storytelling, this complication occurs at one remove, embedded in the matrix of narration. A fortiori, then, I would want to claim in drama, where the situational and inferential data is modeled directly before us in my thesis, and our attention is constantly held by a foundational practice of deception in the actor's deliberate and sustained ostentation to us of not being the thing he is, or being the thing he is not. Like Foe's emphasis on situation, Boyd's observations are cognate in these respects with Aristotle's, particularly on the question of what the central object of dramatic mimesis is. In Poetics 2, Aristotle offers his basic claim that mimetic artists portray people in action, throwing the emphasis squarely on the presentation and analysis of behaviour. His notion of action here is further illuminated in Chapter 6, in speaking of how tragedy is a representation not of people as such, but of actions and life. It's therefore not the function of the agent's action to allow the portrayal of their characters, it is rather for the sake of their actions that characterization is included. And this explains the relative circumscription of Aristotle's account of character in the poetics, which always seems so truncated by comparison with our much more psychologized view. This theoretical commitment to the observation of people in action points back to the foundational move already made in Poetics 4, where Aristotle grounds artistic production in general in two causes rooted in nature. The latter, lesser cause to which Aristotle gives no sustained attention is melody and rhythm, what Boyd addresses under the heading of pattern, and which I'll set aside here. But the first and more important cause is that to imitate is a part of human nature from childhood, and humans differ from other animals in that they are the most imitative and learn their first lessons by imitating. I don't know how Aristotle might have changed that if he'd been a primatologist, but presumably he never saw uh, one of the higher primates in action. Learning and making inferences, as I suggested before, about agents and actions caught up in a network of necessities and likelihoods simply is, for Aristotle, the activity of dramatic spectation, whose general goal is, as Boyd puts it, engaging and attuning our social and moral emotions and values, enticing us to think beyond the immediate in the way our minds are most naturally disposed in terms of social actions. A hypothesis of the origins and essential character of drama drawing on these materials were presented then as the playful performance of pretend social behaviour to attract the attention of others and as an object of inference and evaluation. What makes such a performance compelling is at bottom the same innate disposition to inspection and evaluation that animated the chiefs at Monato Zoo. What sort of person is this? What sort of action is he or she engaged in? How does that action mesh with those of other actors, likewise portraying agents, and so on? As Aristotle proposes, these are the crucial questions. And when this task is complicated in the theatre, in theatre by the ever-present possibility of the actors revealing and even acknowledging both his deception and perhaps even his awareness of our knowledge of his deception, the cognitive task and its pleasures can be further compounded. Which is one reason why actors corpsing and provoking others to corpse, you know what corpsing is, right? 
laughing involuntarily at their own performance. It's wonderful to watch old videotapes of Peter Cook and Dudley Moore doing their, their um, sequences and provoking each other into corpsing. And you can see the, the, the communication of the little smile in the corner of the mouth, which is then grown involuntarily by the other one. And they go back and forth and they look away and try to still the face and then come back again. And it's great fun watching that communication taking place inside the scenario that they're at the same time constructing. Let me give a few examples of this activity and its particular pleasures to give some specific contours to the argument. Some years ago, watching a famous Kyogen comedy in Japan, though completely unable to understand the words, I was nonetheless delighted, as were others more knowledgeable, in the actor's painstaking and deft delineation of an old ferryman who suddenly realises that his new prospective son-in-law bowing on the floor in front of him is the very same man that he has just robbed of a cask of fine sake carried in his ferry to be presented as a betrothal gift to him. <laughs> the character's agony of social embarrassment and his desperate and very readable attempts to avoid being recognised as the thief by his victim, which included covering his face with his beard and so on, now in front of him and requesting to marry his daughter, provided an eruption of comic joy, which had precisely to do with the complex circulation of recognition and concealment of work, at work among actor, character and audience as the actor revealed to us in horrible detail precisely how and what the character was also attempting at the same time to conceal from the suitor. And here, what Thomas Whittaker distinguishes as the performed action was carefully shadowed and framed by the actor's sustained communication not only of his character towards his fellow actors, but also of his skill in delineating it towards us. Our joy was derived across the interaction of these two communicative streams which functioned at once to celebrate the performer's comic skill and to provide an exploration of social codes of politeness, deference, dignity, and their gross disruption. Or to take another example, the late English comedian Benny Hill, whom you may recall, was by no means a great actor, but he was an extraordinarily gifted clown with a particular talent for engaging his audience with his jokes. For me, though, his most magnificent comic moments were not the jokes themselves, which were sometimes clever, but mostly simple and usually rather dull and bawdy, so much as the moments of contact with the audience immediately preceding those jokes, when his expression communicated clearly and delightfully, those of you who know or remember this expression, I think, um, it was absolutely irresistibly infectious, communicated clearly and delightfully, not just that he knew the punchline was coming, not even that he knew that you knew that he knew that the punchline was coming. But perhaps I was always inclined to think that he knew that you knew that he knew that you knew that he knew that the punchline was coming. And in such moments, it was our ability to read his awareness of our knowledge of his manipulation of us leaking irresistibly out onto his face. That was marvellously funny and endearing. Kind of exponential corpsing, as it were made the actual joke just a pretext for a moment of really quite complex content and communication with the audience. Where more than solo performance is in question, stage action develops a deliberately modulated patterning of exchanges and mutual representations, which often takes the implicit and sometimes explicit form of a kind of game between the actors and between the actors and the audience. A game with variably collaborative and competitive dimensions that audiences are invited to trace and appreciate and collude in. I think here of the magnificent enjoyment of the scenes in the Manapuri Shumaglila between an aggressive domineering master and his weakling cowardly servant, where the managed alternation of bluster and entreaty in the actors became a great source of pleasure. Or again, the, the sheer physical joy of both actors and audience in the game-like scenes of hunting the magic stag with their intensely rhythmic physicality and mimetic directness. It's not necessary in order to enjoy such performances to know exactly what is going on. Enjoyment may derive from understanding the general schema of activity within fairly broad parameters by the way the actors are communicating and framing their communication of simple social information about basic relations and situations. 
There is, I think, a corollary, though, which affects the performance of scenic situation. Actors from widely various performance traditions need to find, and the audience to grasp, a decodable set of conventions shared for exchanging social cues and information. And in the absence of such a shared code, situation as such may not coherently arise or be conveyed. Conversely, finding a situation such that actors can mutually engage in and with one another using the communicative tools available to them may be necessary for satisfactory performance to take place at all. And this was brought home to me by attending another Kyogen performance in Osaka on a different occasion, which was a very interesting experimental venture in which a, a Kyogen actor uh, from the company, the hosting company, and a visiting Commedia actor who'd been there for uh, a couple of months had worked on a performance in which both traditions could appear on the stage together. Neither a standard Kyogen scenario nor a Commedia one they had discovered. They talked about this afterwards, and I can sort of speak enough Italian to follow that side of the conversation. I didn't have a clue what the Japanese part of it was. Neither a standard Kyogen scenario nor a Commedia one they had discovered was suitable. And what they eventually presented used elements of comedy and social life common to both traditions. A drunken husband identified as an Italian expatriate artist of the 19th century and his Japanese friend returned home to the former's Japanese wife to be met with angry recrimination and expulsion from the doorstep for being late and disorderly. They then attempt an extended scene uh, in which they imagine taking an intoxicated revenge before being driven off once more by the enraged spouse. It's quite a short, um, quite a short scene. This, this short and very simple performance was lively and engaging, but at times somewhat awkward in articulation for reasons which emerged in audience discussion afterwards, and again, this is possibly compromised by the fact that I could follow the Italian actor, but not his Japanese counterpart. The actors commented on the high degree of difficulty they had had in developing a framework to allow the relatively formalized, inflexible, and rather square spatial and performative code of the no-based Kyogen to occupy the same theatrical space and to engage with the more fluid and improvisatory spatial and interpersonal language of the comedia. They said they had a lot of trouble simply interacting with one another as figures in the scenario, the situation couldn't be made to work because their, their lines of communication weren't, weren't working in terms of their technique. They tried, before getting on drunkenness as a central communicating term, they tried a variety of scenarios and found great difficulty since neither spoke the other's language, either literally or um, performatively, in conveying and developing a situation theatrically in their embodiment, their movement, and their gesture. At the level of developed performance traditions, it seems, situations may be codified differently so that presenting them successfully as a situation is impeded. It was especially interesting to me that drunkenness, since it so often involves the comic disabling of norms of behaviour, was the ground on which the actors found they could reach one another. The gross simplifications of the intoxicated seemed to allow more basic situational material, such as standing up versus falling down, and they did quite a lot of falling down, to be explored and shared with the audience. To come to the particular focus of this conference then, we might ask how the basic task of divining and extrapolating a situation that humans as primate social observers are fitted for bears on the translatability of humour, in this case Shakespeare's humour, or simply on scenic situation more largely between cultures. It would be hard to imagine a dramatic framework more remote from my own experience than the Schumann Lilo play. Yet certain patterns in its actions were readily identifiable and easily enjoyed, among them as it happens drunkenness. This suggests a basic orientation on bodily posture and its control as sources of information about an agent's situation and likely behaviour. Other points of specific translatable interest, I suggest, may derive also from basic governing concerns in primate troops that are also at the centre of human social life and about which we are adept gatherers and communicators of information. Markers having to do with emotional states or dispositions such as friendliness, hostility, allegiance, social or sexual affiliation and so on. 
as well as fundamental interrelated information about gender, age, social status, and hierarchical position, and their negotiability in given circumstances. That was actually, I think, what made Shakespeare and Agabunda quite hard to decipher, is that the information that positioned the different characters with relation to one another was mostly conveyed by dialogue rather than by um, positioning or other clues which I can read. Status transactions not totally dependent on specific local information are readily scannable in the Schumann Lila, especially if the comedy was generated by the relations and misadventures of the principal bully boy warrior and his cowardly servant psychic. Articulated through situations that could easily have been either Lazzi sequences in a commedia or Shakespearean exchanges between such figures as Petruchio and Grumio, Antiphilus and Romeo, or Valentine and Speed. Setting aside for now questions of cultural capacity or, and colonial history that nevertheless remain deeply entangled in the matter, the high translatability of Shakespeare's work, the observed fact from which the Canada play departs, may have partly to do on the one hand with the comparative simplicity and ready readability of the situations out of which his plots are built. Imagine Johnson's new inn being performed for an audience that didn't speak English. Barely succeed for an audience that did speak English. Um, the ready readability of situations out of which his plots are built. And on the other hand, the common use of self-conscious or recursive material, both in the narrative, as with the Pyramus and Disby play in A Midsummer Night's Dream, and in the design of major scenes, such as the spying scenes of Twelfth Night and Much Ado. The, the, Shakespeare's interest in spying seems to me to tap into that, that uh, primary interest in scanning what someone else knows in relation to the distribution of different knowledges uh, across a situation. Both the humour and the accessibility of Shakespearean comedy as translatable seem to me to rely on their consistent use of theatrical transactions involving basic human skills at scanning situations and monitoring the flow of social information through and about them. Shakespeare is not alone in the ability to devise complex occasions of this kind, but he does seem to me unusually gifted at it. And perhaps that's one reason why his plays have lent themselves so readily to being disassembled and reconstructed for other contexts, locations, and audiences. A question that remains for me, however, concerns the variable relations play by play and even scene by scene of mimesis and metadrama. What I've sketched here is the actor's depiction of situation and their presentation of the relation of their own depiction to that situation. Both are regular objects of delight in the theatre, and neither, I think, ought to be stigmatised or bracketed wholly in favour of the other. I'm as interested in, in direct mimesis as I am in complicated, um, ironically bracketed or framed or transgressed or subverted uh, moments of metadrama. One way to discuss a particular performance, to take its bearings, as it were, might be to assess how it positions itself, itself and its audience regarding orientations towards mimesis and metadrama. From what interlocking of purposes are mimesis and metadrama deployed with respect to one another in the occasions of playing itself in particular cases? And how do they square with, modify, and manage each other? But this, we might say, only returns us to the question of drama itself as a form of human activity. Thank you.